it used to be so much simpler. Before settlers arrived, salmon and steelhead experienced a much less complicated migration cycle. The journey was certainly miraculous in its own right, but humans and their needs changed the migration of fish forever. Before our encroachment, anadromous fish were not challenged by dams, culverts, commercial gill nets, flood control systems, logging, mining, irrigation operations, modern infrastructure, or the now protected predators that are ravaging our fish. These man-made obstructions have created a massive impact on their survival. Historically, the natural unfettered cycle resulted in unprecedented abundance. Then settlers arrived, drawn to rivers swollen with year-round runs of salmon. They built major towns and developed suburbs over habitat where salmon once flourished. With the advent of canning techniques and worldwide demand, runs were quickly overfished. The first cannery was built on the Lower Columbia in 1866, resulting in an estimated 275,000 pound catch of Chinook. Four years later, Chinook harvest on the Lower Columbia had increased to an astounding 10,200,000 pounds of canned Chinook. Before the beginning of the 20th century, a decade before hatcheries were even a consideration, the Columbia's runs, estimated to have once numbered somewhere between 12 and 17 million fish, were in peril. As a result, hatcheries were built to compensate for overharvest created by the invention of the can and the disruption of hydropower on migrating fish. Today we are fighting for the very hatcheries that prevented the extinction of wild stocks. Hatchery operations and methodologies are being modernized and old, less effective practices are being phased out. I think we can we can restore some populations of wild fish that be abundant, strong in some locations, but uh, the kinds of, of recovery efforts and the kinds of the numbers of targets of fish that we have to have in order to remove fish from say the Endangered Species Act listing, um, I don't I don't see us today having the ability to do that without having hatcheries be a part of that puzzle. Salmon have been a part of the West since time immemorial. Uh, when Lewis and Clark came out here uh, in the early 1800s, they came to an area where the rivers were teeming with fish. And the Native Americans who were here before them, they used and relied on salmon as part of their uh, survival and they, for cultural, uh, religious, and sustenance reasons, Salmon have been an integral part of the West for forever. And we are now um, facing a period where um, our fish runs are greatly affected. And it's, it's kind of one of those situations where we probably need to do something really fast. Otherwise, we're going to lose what we had and what we have right now. Recent vetted and peer-reviewed scientific research estimates that without hatchery supplementation, a return to wild fish abundance would take several hundred years. Some studies predict short-term extinction of wild fish due to predation, overharvest, and ocean conditions. Yet there are still several well-funded organizations that claim hatcheries are to blame for the decline in the wild fish populations, even though no study or peer-reviewed science in the last 25 years has proven that. Hatcheries are under attack from organizations like the Wild Fish Conservancy, Native Fish Society, and large, deep-pocketed corporations like Patagonia based in Southern California. Anti-hatchery rhetoric often relies on select, outdated science and patently false statements. There are many myths propagated by these anti-hatchery organizations, including Hatchery fish are no different than open water farm fish raised in a pen. Hatchery fish are genetically flawed and inferior. Hatchery fish compete with wild fish on the reds. Hatchery fish are slowing wild fish recovery. 
Eliminating hatchery runs would have no significant economic impact on the Pacific Northwest. We invite you to visit our website for the science and data to support the fact that none of the aforementioned statements are true. Where would we be without hatcheries? Wild fish are important. Important that we maintain the habitats that support wild fish so they can continue to evolve genetically to fit and survive in those environments. Hatchery fish are important because we want fish to catch and, and harvest. And it's a fact that a lot of these hatchery programs are dependent upon wild fish. If we implement these more modern broodstock programs where we're using invasive genes only, I think we're only gonna enhance and improve our, our wild stocks, as well as offer opportunity for people to harvest some fish every now and then too. And if we aren't able to harvest some fish from time to time, people are really gonna lose interest. In reality, hatcheries have helped prevent extinction. Today, most runs are at historic lows and are hemorrhaging due to natural and man-made developments we can't control. Hatchery fish supplementation and broodstock programs continue to be crucial to the battle against extinction of our hatchery and wild fish populations. Scientific analysis has determined that salmon reared for a single generation in a hatchery do not reduce the fitness of wild fish, and use of in-basin stock is now considered best practices. In Washington, 75% of salmon harvested in Puget Sound and 90% of steelhead statewide are hatchery fish. 90% of salmon and steelhead swimming in the Columbia come from hatcheries. These are very important numbers. Without hatchery fish, sport fishing as we know it in the Northwest will diminish and a very large sport fishing industry will be radically eroded. This is what the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife stated in 2017. Fish hatcheries have become an important tool in restoring and conserving the state's wild, naturally spawning salmon and steelhead populations. These fish were left for us by God thousands of years ago. And I just don't think we have the right to waste them as we did in the beginning. Driven by the southern resident orca's diminished food supply and subsequent die-off, substantial budgets are being approved for hatchery salmon production in the Washington Puget Sound region. There are numerous hatchery supplementation success stories. In a tributary of the Clearwater River, only five spawning pairs remained of the summer Chinook run. The Nez Perce tribe implemented a hatchery supplementation program. That effort ultimately increased the adult return numbers to well over 1,000 and in subsequent years topped 2,000 summer Chinook. When we think about fishing, we think about lots of different things and, and everyone comes at it from a different spot. People travel from all over the world to fish our neck of the woods here and without, without those salmon and steelhead, we, that alleviates a lot of opportunity. You know, and then what's, what's frustrating to me is to see the decline in, in the hatcheries or how, you know, they, they're, each year it seems like they're, they're putting less and less in where it should be going the other way. I mean, just to keep the seals and the birds all that happy, you know, they should be dumping more fish in the hatcheries, not less. As a federal fish hatchery, we realize we have a very important role in terms of augmenting harvest and meeting our uh, treaty trust responsibilities, but at the same time, the Endangered Species Act is very clear in that hatcheries must be run and operated in a way that facilitates and does not impede wild production of fish to continue to occur where there is, where there is habitat. Removing hatchery fish, however, hasn't resulted in fish abundance. Over 25 years ago, Oregonians embraced a plan to eliminate a robust run of summer hatchery steelhead on the Upper Clackamas River. Theoretically, eliminating hatchery fish would result in a significant wild fish population rebound. In 2020, the American Fisheries Society published a study by Ian Corder and his colleagues at Mount Hood Environmental, PGE, USGS, and the Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission that contradicted every premise put forward. After over 25 years, the wild fish run on the Clackamas had not rebounded, but had actually declined. There is no known instance where the reduction or elimination of hatchery supplementation has resulted in an increase in wild fish productivity or abundance, absent other contributing factors.
you know, the reality is that there's, there's a mix of different approaches to science and um, our approach is, is to remain objective and let the data and analysis drive our inferences. When you think of the Pacific Northwest, I mean, gosh, I hope people think of salmon. Um, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it, we're surrounded by it. Um, you know, just with the rivers and the ocean right here. And um, I think a lot of restaurants do have salmon on their menu uh, or their fresh sheet or as a special. Um, I actually have it on our menu. We serve it every day that we're open. And uh, it's, it's, it's good, it's a good fish. Our tribes were here, they used the fishing here. That was part of their sustainability, is being able to fish and then utilize every piece of the fish for their uh, sustainability and livability. So we have been that kind of a community for a long time and we love that heritage. We love that we were started out as essential transportation, essential uh, food was found here and the livability was found from the river also for the irrigation of crops. Uh, we were an ag community from way back when. So it has been an essential piece for our survival is having that water. Salmon and steelhead in the Pacific Northwest are much more than just a fish to catch. Um, a lot of people rely on this fish for sources of income, for economies to grow in the small communities up and down the coast and even inland along the rivers, but also too because it's a lifestyle to a lot of our sport fishermen. There's some people that they never want to see another hatchery fish. But the wild fish, by some of our hatchery reductions, our wild fish runs haven't gotten any better. Uh, actually, I think the myself, I think the hatchery fish is a is a big brother to the wild fish because it takes the pressure off that wild fish being killed and being able to propagate again. Fish, the fish are important as as the fish themselves, and we have no right to not take care of something that was left for us to use. We don't want to operate our hatcheries in a way that's going to negatively impact wild fish, wild genetics. And at the same time, absent, absent hatchery fish, there's a lot of um, opportunity that's lost in terms of our ability to fish. Absent hatcheries, we wouldn't be fishing in Washington right now. Absent hatcheries, as I mentioned earlier, um, we would probably have lost some stocks. They would have blinked out already. And um, again, absent some improvements in some pretty degraded habitat, um, those hatchery programs are keeping, keeping the species alive. Hatcheries are not the cause of the decline of wild fish. Modern society, predation, loss of habitat, ocean conditions, fresh water quality and quantity, and overharvest have caused those declines. It's time to stop scapegoating hatcheries. We need to fight for funding and become informed proponents. We have to demand science and economic driven decisions from our lawmakers. Our Pacific Northwest hatcheries are critical to allowing future generations opportunity to enjoy salmon and steelhead fisheries at abundant, healthy levels. The Hatchery and Wild Coexist campaign is focused on highlighting the importance of our hatcheries and the role they play in wild fish recovery and providing abundant fisheries. Go to hatchery-wild-coexist.com, learn the facts, and help spread the word about hatcheries. Hatchery Wild Coexist is science-driven and data-driven. It's something we need right now. We can't wait another minute, kids. We want wild fish and we want hatchery fish to be able to fish for all the fish. Check it out.